Ok. Okay, I think it's about time, so let's get started. Uh, I know everyone is uh, hungry and want to go grab some beer, so I won't try and keep you too long. Um, hello everyone, and thank you for coming and listening to me. My name is Kim Hindart, I work at City Network, and I usually introduce it by saying, uh, welcome ladies and gentlemen, but I was told that that's wrong to say because not everyone identifies as a lady or gentleman. So, hello fellow humans and other life forms. It's totally inclusive. Uh, in uh, school you were taught that you were supposed to have something personal to share in order for us to relate to each other. So, my name is Kim Hindart, I'm security officer at uh, City Network and I hear four distinct voices in my head at any given moment. Now you have something to relate to. Don't worry, it's no, no danger to you. Only two of them is telling me I should eat you. So there's quite a minority. But with that said, you look perfectly delicious today. Anyway, uh, introductions out of the way. Let's talk a bit about security and what gives you actually the most bang for the buck. <sighs> This assumes that you do have basic security, so you should have some type of perimeter protection. I mean, anyone here not using firewalling? Yeah, you should use firewalling. If you don't, uh, you're in trouble. So I'm telling you this from the perspective that you are actually deploying some type of firewalling, you are uh, deploying some type of uh, network surveillance to know, do we have any open ports? Are the ports open then? Are they open for vulnerabilities? Have we connected everything? This is decently enough automated today. And this is totally open source and works just fine. Uh, IP tables uh, and map open was works terrific for this situation. Uh, user authentication, yeah, use SSH. Try and use multi-factor. Uh, don't just use passwords. Over 99.9% .9 of all password breaches are cleared by using multi-factor authentication. So multi-factor authentication clears away all the password shit you get from automated attacks. So enable firewalling, enable user authentication, and enable multi-factor authentication, and you're pretty well set. This is the external threats that you might have, and if we have passed them, what are the in biggest threats for data breaches then? Statistically, where does data breaches come from? W what is the event that has have actually tracked shit into your system? This is stati stati <coughs> statistically validated uh, data from a survey for over 1,000 enterprises that had been so, uh, identified to have some type of data breach. And like you can see, the m biggest culprits are email websites, foreign USB drives that I was just forced to insert into my computer here. So <laughs> that's a nice thing. So don't do that. Don't do as I showed you to do. So anyway, uh, the major part you can notice with these things is it's only the bottom one that's very techy. That's still a procedure thing, so you can't get rid of the people here, but still, that's mostly techy. So, software vulnerabilities, yeah, simple enough. Go CICD. Uh, I perfectly understand that it's not simple to implement a CICD. Believe me, we know that one. But that's the simple solution for software vulnerabilities. And there are awesome, awesome talks this summit about that. So go CICD. The rest of the things, that's up to people. You can have hyper, hyper tech all you want, but it's still up to people. And what do I mean by that? Yeah, 
for all the rest of the things, all the surveys showed that there was a dialogue prompt that some user had clicked, pass, okay, check, you got the prompt, are you sure you want to do this? And they say, yes, because it's an automated thing. I want to get this done. Uh, this attachment wants to have this type of permission. Do we allow it? Yes, click, and then you're done. So it's some type of user error in this. So we are into the humans with the, all the rest of the stuff. Uh, I like to compare this to, I bought a really, really premium high secure safe for keeping confidential files in that safe. Then next morning after the newly installed super secure safe, that cost a lot of money, the confidential files were stored on top of that safe. So my investment in security, well, it broke the first time it encountered humans because they forgot to lock the files into the safe. So that's, yeah. So the human factor is the factor that will end up in trouble. Well, how do you then handle the human factor? Yeah, well, <laughs> this is also statistically proven that more than 99% of all critical data breaches is due to human error. So it's the human part that fails, that's the big part. And this is not something you can simply get away with by tech alone. Uh, because it's not malicious intent, by far. The most common thing is a common mistake. We all make mistakes. Anyone here who says, I've never made a mistake in my entire life? No, we all make mistakes. That's being human. And it's sort of hard to get rid of us. I know there are a lot of techie fantasies of not having any humans at all, but I mean, yeah, i really not fond of that future. Uh, so, how many here think we can script the humans? We can write a playbook that says, do not do wrong configurations, do not do any mistakes, and shoot them into the head of the humans. How many here think that would be an awesome future? Yeah, a few. Uh, there's always a few that thinks that would be an awesome future, until I tell you some mad Korean guy will hack you. <laughs> and then you will have the mad Koreans army walking around it. And that's not a good idea. That's a very bad idea. So believe me. <laughs> so no, we can unfortunately not just script and write a playbook that fixes the human mind. This takes time. This takes education. I've tried to look up a bit of the definitions of education. Uh, they say education on Wikipedia is information about or training in a particular subject. I dare say that I want to complement this a bit and say information, education is uh, information and training. We are pretty good at spreading information. We are in the information society. That's just data visualized and <laughs> conceptualized in a certain manner. So the crazy Korean is here talking to you and you're all sitting here. So we are spreading information. But in order to actually get educated in a topic, in order to actually get some type of change in behavior, in order to know what you're doing, you need some type of training as well. Anyone here having a driver's license? Yeah, a few. Did you have to do just the theory and said, okay, I've read off, now I am ready to go drive. No, you had, I bet you had to do some type of training as well. Well, there are specimens in the human race that can actually, just from theory, learn how to function well in practice, but most of us cannot, most of us need training. And this is something that we tend to neglect. We're good at going conferences, we're good at <sighs> studying things. We are not as good at following up and having a training with them. How many here have an IT policy you have to follow? A bunch of you. How many here have regular training on following that IT policy? Ah, a few of you, that's great. You see, <coughs> a 
lot of times we end up just getting the information and not focusing enough on the training. So, we are humans, we have human needs. When I try and tell uh, people that professional sports and professional tech have a lot in common because they're human, people say, <gasps> no, that can't be. And I say, what do we do to optimize the performance of a professional team? We practice, we practice working as a team. We practice our skills and we take into account our human needs. Yeah, sounds horrible for techie people because we want to back to the playbook into the mind now, but still, this takes time. And unfortunately, there's no shortcut in it. It takes time. But if you want to work as a well-functioning team, yeah, you need to practice that together. What are the key findings we had in our case when we tried to test this and see can we deploy the similar things that work for professional athletics into our company because are the people working in IT any less professional than uh, pro athletes that work? No, not really. You get a lot of pay to do a work. Why shouldn't the company have an invested interest in you having optimal performance? Well, you need to build a culture. What is the culture then? Let's get the defini definition. A set of standards and beliefs that the group shares and values and hold each other accountable to. In order for any type of training to work, you need to follow a set of standards as well. And you need to be able to call each other out and say, now you're deviating from this set of values that we hold each other accountable to. That's the whole idea how this can actually work in the long run. You cannot have policing on top that's going down all the time. You will spend enormous amount of uh, resources just doing the policing. Groups and teams have to be self-teaching, self-reliant, self-correcting in this sense. This can uh, totally go uh, the other way around as well. If <laughs> the, the group start to get uh, values that deviate too much from what you want them, but uh, yeah, <laughs> that's another part. But this is culture and uh, Culture drives habits. Habits drives behavior. And it's the behavior that gives you the results you're actually looking for. So this is needed in security. You really need this in security. What we started with City was a daily check-in. I want to know how are the staff feeling. So the staff in each team had to be open into the team had, have I had a bad day? Have I had a good day? Am I perfectly suited to do really, really complex firewall administration today or not? Perhaps not if they had a really sucky day. And we tend to think ah, you shouldn't bring your personal life into work. Anyone here who can totally disconnect anything from their home when they go to work and say, off, now it's only work. No, I don't think so. What happens in your life affects you. And we have to take that into account. So I get a lot of reports as a head of security from the infrastructure. How is that feeling? How are the firewalls doing? And we tend not to get that many reports. How are the staff doing? And this is, by me, a far more important report to get because we have ups and downs as humans. We change on a daily basis. So I want to know that every manager had had a check-in with all the staff and they have all reported, check, I'm fit for this and I'm fit for this and I'm not fit for this today. And they know that. That's a crazy important report for me to have this daily check that the staff are doing all right. 
We have an example from an uh, incident at one of our data centers. This was not we ourselves, but we were co-located. So one of in the neighboring racks, a staff member went in with a can of gasoline, handcuffed himself to the rack and the servers, and set himself on fire. I dare say that something has really, really been missed <laughs> all the days before leading up to this. You should have been able to catch this if you're an intensive employee. So these incidents should actually be something you can see. If you have a daily check-in with your staff, you should know are they feeling good, are they feeling bad. So, one of the biggest myth, I will say, with this daily check-in is also taking away the myth of multitasking. How many here have heard that, um, did you see, good multitasking, good multitasker? How many th have been at an employee that actually premiums a good multitasker? Multitasking as a human is unfortunately Im totally impossible. We are not equipped to do any multitasking. That's a big myth. We have a good focus and we have a good way of shifting focus quickly, but it's still shifting focus. We only have a very, very small thing that actually reach our conscious mind. All of you here, close your eyes. The wall to your right contains paintings. What do they picture? You've all seen them. You are all aware that there are <laughs> that you have seen paintings on that wall because you have all passed into this room, but no one can really describe the, uh, the pictures on the painting. You can open your eyes now. And that's because they don't stream into our conscious mind. We don't register consciously everything that goes into our mind. So we are bad multitaskers. And this is something you can easily try and get away and avoid because what are the biggest, biggest problem in security by far? Yeah, multitasking is really dangerous from a security point. Because imagine if you have six priorities that have the same importance in your head. You have six tasks you need to do. And you're doing one and you get distracted. And believe me, we will be distracted. That's unfortunate with us as humans. Even if we are totally isolated, totally silent room, our own mind will distract us. So we will be distracted. The, the thing is what happens when you go back to doing another task from which you were distracted. If you have six equally important things, there's a big chance you end up starting a new task instead. And that's when you end up leaving your keys in your front door. That's when you end up storing the confidential files on top of the safe. That's when you do something half done. That's when you do not go back and finish what you've started because in your mind you have done the task. In your mind you recognize that I've done the task. So half finished tasks are a crazy, crazy important thing. So I will give you an advice about uh, some training. Uh, let's see. Take a post-it and write down the single most important task you have at hand right now. Place that post-it somewhere where you remember it. And then when you're distracted, and you will be distracted, a lot you will be distracted. You can always easily and quickly go back to that post-it and see, this is the task I have to finish. Once you finished it, put it on a trophy platter somewhere. Store it as a trophy and then write down the next most important task for me right now to remember that I need to finish. You will see that you will be a lot more efficient and not doing this. So this is my training and exercise <laughs> suggestion to you. Go home, 
start to practice this and see where do you get, do you get anything from this? Because, like I said, anyone who believes this is a safer guy than not being distracted. Distractions is a danger to security. But we will be distracted. That's just the fact of it. So, most of the human breaches that we could see in the organization that were what we call oopsies, really these things that didn't lead to a breach but could have led to something catastrophic just by people tending to forget something. Why do we leave keys in the front door? Yeah, today it's usually something to do with the phone. That's the biggest distraction we have today where so something is blipping in the phone uh, or on your wrist today as you ha we have a uh, clock store now that and watches that are blipping. But that's a huge distraction. And when you do that, that's when you forget this stuff and go back. So, the exercise, go back, test this, and see what you can do <coughs> with the uh, with that. So, what more did we discover? We discovered that the oopsies we had in our company was actually based and uh, the clustered on uh, the work hours before lunch, not after lunch. So we had this practice that we actually provided uh, the breakfast sandwiches. It was mandatory for our staff to have breakfast sandwiches just to get the blood sugar correctly. We saw a drop in oopsies. And believe me, this is now a case study. So we are moved away from scientifically validated stuff. This is what we experienced. But I saw a drop in oopsies when I could give, uh, make sure that my staff had a proper blood sugar level. And that's interesting because it doesn't cost that much to provide breakfast sandwiches. You might think so, but it's not the hotel's breakfast buffet you need to provide. You need to provide uh, bread and some type of <coughs> of things to have on the sandwich that's nutritionally proper. So no white bread. But if you just do that, they will sustain themselves until lunch. And in the meanwhile, there's a trick to it. If you provide something to eat for people, they tend to sit down for a moment. And during that moment, it's an opportune time to set what is my single most priority, write my post-it and communicate and do a check-in with the team. This helped with our OPSIS a lot more and cost a lot less than uh, the very, very expensive SIM I actually purchased and this running log analysis against. I had to purchase that from a compliance perspective, but that has helped me far lot less than actually having focus on not multitasking too much. Focusing on having a good check-in and focusing on building a culture where we actually work safe. That's it for me, so I will not keep you that much longer. Any questions? Yeah, absolutely. We uh, yes, he has to do. He has a boss, and the boss wants numbers. And I say absolutely. 
we have numbers. Uh, like I said, you should be prepared that this is not scientifically validated because we have no far near enough case study. But we could see over 90% reduction on just working with the humans as a routine practice. Uh, and I have ha yet not had any OPSI stop by our SIM. And our SIM cost around, uh, around 300 times more than our breakfast practice. So yeah, so before you start to invest, and the SIM is this hyper, hyper intelligent machine learning stuff that does, but the license for that is crazy in comparison to the actual things it has prevented compared to making a normal breakfast meeting sandwich where we actually value our interconnectivity as humans. Yeah, any more questions? Yeah? I say uh, the poster technique. Uh, it's start your day by taking a post-it and writing down the single most important priority for you today, the single most important task you should do right now. Write it down on a post-it and put it somewhere. Uh, like I said, you will be distracted during the day. It will take attention away from that. But you know always what to quickly return to. Your mind will be programmed to quickly return to it. And the, the, the more you practice this, the better you will be of not being too disrupted when you're distracted and going back. And most importantly, you will finish the task completely that you're doing. And you will see that you will be more efficient. You will clear more tasks during one day than by not doing this. So this is a good training exercise. I recommend you to do personally. Any more questions? Yeah? The question was, uh, how does this matter work with meeting days? Because you will be now disrupted by meetings all the time. And that's perfectly true and that's perfectly honest. But like I said, this is a good thing to go back to to remember, have I finished this or not? So if you are having a task that you wi know will be interrupted with meetings, that's a good s uh, thing to practice because you know, is this finished or not? And that's really important to know have I actually finished it? So not to start a new task when there's one unfinished. That's never good. You should never have several uncompleted tasks <laughs> at the same time. Uh, there is a huge, huge chance you will miss one of them and then there will be uh, easily a security failure somewhere in long that. So yes, we need to account for us having a lot of meetings. That's just the reality of things. It's a matter of how quickly can we get back to what we should have on top of our mind then. Yeah, any more questions? Okay. Thank you very much.